Well, thanks for quieting down. Good morning. A very important announcement. Uh, Eva Pilin was born this morning at 2 a.m. in the old blue fire. Well, <laughs> Scott, Scott, try to top that. Should I go? No. I was just saying, try to top that enough. Yeah. Why even try? Okay, can we quiet down? For the final session, uh, we're going to start off with uh, Scott Grafton from University of Santa Barbara. Well, after Yorn's RSA talk and a baby being born, this is, I don't know, this is top. Anyway, you guys look great after all that grappa. <laughs> I thought this is going to be an easy talk because everyone would just be. <laughs> no, you're all, you're all great. Um, right, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, I'm one of the action people. Um, traditionally, we study action through these very focused uh, paradigms like the classic general reaching studies, where the concept of a goal is anchored on the object. We really dial in on the kinematics of the reach. We look at the uh, kinematic tells uh, that, that reflect internal planning processes. And that sort of gives us a sense of how we plan and specify action. And uh, that's all fine and well. Um, but we've gotten uh, interested in sort of more naturalistic <laughs> problems that, that are relevant to the real world. You know, in fact, we do, we do more things in life than grasp uh, wood blocks. Uh, we can, we can re rethink what, you know, what is a goal? You know, if I need a log cabin, I need some wood. And if I need some wood, I got to pick some trees and choose some trees. I got to start swinging my ax, right? And that's, that's the real nature of action planning. And um, this is kind of the state of play in, uh, I think, uh, action studies right now. This is, this is sort of the way we approach the problem. Um, you can see, though, that there's, the loop isn't complete here, right? There's still something missing in this conceptualization, and that is, I get a pile of logs, I still need to go back and, you know, put a log cabin together. And that's, that's kind of the nature of, of what I want to emphasize today. And it, what I'm going to throw out here is some very, very new, uh, simple data not a lot of data. We've had more than enough data in the last two days. Um, but really, just to introduce the idea that for this program in action science to continue, uh, I think it's really worthwhile to start thinking of strategies for, for how we might um, characterize what's going on in people as they're doing these harder action-based problems, like building log cabins. So that's the main goal. Now. Um, Alfonso was kind enough to, to visit us for the last month, and he emphasized on multiple occasions that it's critical, really, to have a theory that drives this. And so this is the theory of idiomotor and kinematic engrams for action, which means that basically um, how we do this planning is constrained by what we know uh, about movement and action planning. In other words, Idiomotor apraxia would be your metaphor here, as well as kinematic engrams. What do we know about this physically possible in the body? Now, that's a tough one to understand, so it's really just called the theory of Ikea. And if you go to an Ikea, what you find is a perfect, you know, experimental platform for uh, understanding this problem of putting things together. Now, you get one of these, you bring it home, this is my favorite instruction. Look at this. You take that part there, <laughs> and you throw it away. Uh, so that's, you know. Now there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of data on on IKEA, and uh, turns out there was a survey done in UK, and 50% of people who've been to an Ikea said they couldn't complete the task, <laughs> which, is, which is startling, right? I mean, 
And that's in the, that's just, oh, and there's also, this is what's really scary, there are now marital counseling, counseling programs where the main procedure is for the couple to put IKEA items together, which to me is, you know, it's amazing. There's a, the spousal murderers and higher. I mean, that is a high risk therapy. Uh, anyway, so, so it's a really interesting space we're in, right? And, and if you, now, um, so this, this reflects the standard, I, you know, half of people in England, I think, uh, right now. Uh, he's very close to getting himself completely contained within that, if you look. Just one, two more steps and I'll be locked in. Uh, which, which begs the question, actually, this is, a, a, this is a good problem for a concepts and actions meeting. What would you actually put, right, in, in the instructions for the people of the UK? Uh, would you do it? Well, anybody, really. But, uh, Right, so why do these things fail so frequently? Um, we don't know. Uh, it's a good problem, but that's an aside. Um, the really interesting thing is what happens when you just open the box and the instructions aren't there at all, which is really what I'm interested in. And um, you get these <laughs> kinds of things. Uh, so, <laughs> now some would claim this is a gain in function mutation. I, I kind of agree with that. Uh, this is pretty nice. Um, so, so that's that's the problem space we're in. So, so if you don't have the instructions and you've got this stuff and you have to put it together, right? Well, how do we do that? And all I want to introduce today is a really simple idea, which is that we do it through progressive changes and representations in the mind. We don't have a single magic box that plans and figures it out and suddenly, voila, we've got a solution. That's kind of how we all think it happens when we do this stuff. But somehow we must transform representations that are useful for, for construction. And, you know, the metaphor here is sort of think of the, the classic physical frames of reference and action representations. You know, we have ice. We have frames of reference and um, they're centered on different body parts and you can think about different representations across that stream, right? So presumably there's something parallel going on when we, we put together our IKEA furniture where we go from problem features, right? So we have to organize uh, the problem itself into you know, abstract structures and then finally into movement sequences. Our literature is dominated by the movement sequence, right? We just jump right to the, okay, I gotta do A and B and C and D, but forgetting that prior to that, there's this, you know, these constructive phases where you really have to identify all the features and the objects, group them, understand their properties. And then the real, the real question that we're kind of interested in, is there a space in between of, of, of really high level abstraction that would uh, be reflected in what you do prior to actually implementing anything physically, right? Can we think at that abstract level? So that's really the program we're interested in. We've got a little bit of data. Um, still a long way to go on this. So, um, so here's, a, here's a case point, right? So uh, if you park your car in the wrong place, it usually, this is what happens. But if you were to think about putting this back together now, you can immediately see the problems, the first stage sort of of this of, you know, okay, here's all the engine over here. So obviously you're already thinking, well, I'll start putting, putting all those things together. You know, you're basically doing perceptual grouping or um, sort of feature-based grouping to, to do the planning. Um, and then ultimately you're gonna sequence the movements. But now suppose it <laughs> happens to both of your cars. Um, you're gonna have, already you're gonna start to see that above and beyond the, the feature grouping and the, the movement specification, there's gonna be common themes from car to car. Okay, I've learned that uh, always do the engine last or always do the engine first so you can essentially chunk or um, group your planning structure in a consistent way across trials. Um, so that's, that's the basic idea. So there's this, this idea of an intermediate layer of abstraction um, that, that could exist, that could apply across multiple kinds of problem, uh, problems. Now, there's not a lot of literature on this. Um, and one of the big questions that comes up is whether any kind of abstract structure that you might generate has anything to do with language. In other words, is there a, a proto-syntax, right, for, um, for action planning? 
that has, has parallels, for example, in language. Um, it's not to say that you use language you know, directly to do planning. You could certainly, why not? You can use verbal strategies all the time. But is there anything in there, are there any analogs? And the closest kinds of experiments uh, essentially look at interference effects between action and, and language. And this is, this is one of my favorite studies. It got us excited. It's from Matt Botvinnik's group at Princeton. And so what they do is, first they do a reading study, okay? So, so if you think about these different cases, let me just read them off. I can't even read that. Huh? So John purchased a carousel ticket, gave it to the attendant, and went for a ride. So you can see the structure of that statement is John does something, gets the ticket, gets the goal, right? Now compare that to case B. Uh, John sliced up some sliced tomatoes, rinsed off some lettuce, and tossed together a salad. So salad's the goal, but you can see there's no dependency between uh, the lettuce and the tomatoes, and they come in and, and um, uh, enter into the goal independently. So it has a different chronological structure, and C is where it says independence. John took off his bathrobe, took a hot shower, and dried it off, so he's got essentially two goals. So you've got these different kinds of um, structures. If you essentially do a repetition priming experiment, here is blocked versus uh, interleaved. You can see the priming effect when you're comparing this to this, A to C and B to C. So the idea is there's sensitivity in the language to these logical structures in, in the view of uh, repetition priming. Now, if you look at now, the point of all that is this experiment, which is first the subject watches someone else stack a block, a set of blocks, and they do it in a linear way or they do it in a triangular form. And then you do, then they do the sentence reading and they again look at reading times. And you see that the reading times are influenced by uh, these initial action primes in a congruent or incongruent way. Pretty simple stuff, really. So it says, it, it's a great teaser, right? Because it just says there's some kind of relationship between um, sort of action structure and and logical structure that's used in language comprehension. So there is some kind of relationship hidden in there, but we really don't know uh, much more about what, you know, what's the full vocabulary of this action structure like. Who knows? Uh, it's an interesting question. Whenever you're ready. Okay, so, so before talking about what we're doing, I want to um, dismiss what's been done. Um, well, not dismiss it, just not do it anymore. Um, so the classic ways of studying action planning are either the Tower of Hanoi or the Tower of uh, London. This is Tower of Hanoi. And uh, does anyone think they're doing any action planning at this point in this task? <laughs> None, right? There's no logic to this. There's, they're essentially counting uh, how many are in each peg, and that's the rule you need to know for what to do next. So it's a very simple algorithm, and you can program up a computer to do it. So um, there's an initial state, yeah, we have to figure out the rules of the game, but uh, you can see experimentally, if you want to study the planning process, uh, you, you hit a wall with this task pretty early. Uh, should we wait till he's done? Oh, she's done. There we go. There we go. Okay, so, it, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of, you can see the natural selection of the literature in terms of Tower of Hanoi, it's kind of falling off over time. Tower of London still has some, some uh, popularity. And this one is better uh, for planning purposes, right, because we can manipulate the goal state and the starting state and, and manipulate the difficulty of um, uh, finding the right solution. <clears throat> you, can, you can manipulate the number of steps, um, the depth of hierarchy. Still, though, it's a fairly small uh, step, uh, set of steps that you can do. Um, so that's, that's sort of, uh, in the literature, Tower of London remains sort of the, the standard benchmark. And so anything we do, we want to make sure at least it's as good or better than, uh, than this is. Um, and if you actually look at what's being manipulated here, um, you're never really changing the, the planning structure. There's never any change in that, that sort of this, this syntax or the abstract nature of what needs to be solved. It's really just direct mapping problems. 
It's really tied to the, to the movement sequence you have to identify. You can't look at anything independent of the movement sequence. And most of the manipulations are just looking at essentially a difficulty effect. So, that, so they're, um, the capacity of this task has some constraints. Um, that said, you know, there are, there are dozens and dozens of imaging studies with Tower of London, and they all pretty much show the same thing. Here's one where you just mentalize doing it and, uh, versus just counting moves and watching someone else do it. And you can see the standard sort of dorsolateral, prefrontal, PMD, um, posterior parietal activation. This is really consistent, and we know in patients with lesions to DLPFC, you're going to be slow at the TOL lab with uh, task with increased errors. So that's a kind of the state of play right now. Um, we are, you know, are still we're really interested in um, are, there, are there changes in these representations that, cha that, that, that occur over the course of planning? And um, if so, does it go from sort of a perceptual grouping process to some kind of abstract stage into uh, you know, motor specification and then finally implementation? And as I just pointed out, the TOL and TOH are just, all these things are kind of conflated. So we want to try, to, can we unpack these stages? Okay. And so we invented a few different t tasks to do this. I'm going to show you two today. Uh, this, this is work by Arianne Johnson, a um, graduate student. So the first task is called the Baggers task. And, oops, you can see what it's motivated by. Um, Right, so he is, this, he's working out here, he's, he's an athlete, uh, he's training for the National Grocers Association uh, Baggers Finals in Las Vegas, yeah, where, where they, uh, they do grocery bagging competitions, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is an interesting task from a planning perspective, right, because uh, we've all done this and there are really specific rules, right, so you can't do a planning task that's rule free. Everything's got a, some kind of external set of constraints on it. And, um, and it's a great space because, um, you know, you've got cold things, you've got uh, dry things, uh, you've got delicate things, you've got heavy things, and we all know you got to put them in the bags right or they get damaged. And so in this task, we gave basically cooked up a task where you have two virtual bags, each bag gets three items. Uh, the, the only, they're told three rules, uh, heavies at the bottom, colds together, and fragiles at the top, right? Which we, everybody knows that rule. Like, even all the patients we've studied know this rule. So it's very simple. And uh, so there's a, there's a successful bagging task. Now the beauty of this, right, is if you think about the, the percent, the actual items vary from trial to trial. The movement sequence they're going to execute varies from trial to trial. It's really just, in this case, it's they're now doing this grouping at their sort of this perceptual end. What are the features of the objects that are going to group them together? Right? So that's, that's what's driving their behavior. Um, right. so, and then the other thing we can do is we can vary, it's a little hard to see, but we can vary the, the nature of, of what the um, objects are. So um, here we've got uh, things that are, uh, the item properties here are just cold things and heavy things. Sorry, they're manip we manipulate cold and weight. So you've got uh, heavy, cold, light, cold, heavy, and light. So that's pretty hard. You've got a lot of things to, to sort out versus the opposite extreme. Light things and heavy things, that's it. So there's only one property that you're having to identify. So we vary the, prop the, the load of property across this range here. So for any, any one trial, there's the interesting thing is uh, this for an innocent little task like this, for any one trial, there's 7,200 possible solutions. Right? That's, that's remarkable if you think about it. And only about 1 to 6% of them are, are correct by chance. Right? So, so it seems trivially easy to us, but it's actually quite hard uh, if you look at it from a probabilistic standpoint. Um, as you get into the uh, more difficult cases, right, you're down to 1%. So the odds are you're going you're gonna to make a mistake, and yet we don't. Uh, we, do, we all do quite well at this. Now, we, we, we tested this uh, with patients, and we tested it with um, normal subjects quite extensively, just to standardize all the items and that kind of stuff. 
What's interesting in the patients is we can essentially replicate sort of the Tower of London kinds of effects, and I just want to run through that very quickly just to convince you that at least it has the same general features as Tower of London. Uh, so this is um, work with primarily Laurel Buxbaum where they kindly allowed us to make their patients do virtual bagging. Uh, we think we had, they're all left hemisphere stroke patients, 10 anteriors, 8 posteriors. I mean, you can see the lesion overlaps there, pretty straightforward. Um, accuracies, uh, this is Bagger's task and Tower of London task, their overall accuracies for controls versus anteriors, posteriors, you know, they're making a few more mistakes, but they're all able to do this task. The interesting thing, of course, is the loading effects, right? So as you go from the more easy grouping problems to difficult grouping problems, you see uh, fall-offs in accuracy. You see it even in, in control subjects but it's uh, quite dramatic in the anteriors and uh, less so in the posteriors. Uh, the same sort of pattern you observe in Tower of London. And the point here is not to say, oh, it's better or worse than Tower of London. It's just to say, really, in general, it has the same sort of loading sensitivity you would see in, in other kinds of planning tasks. Uh, so obviously, it would take a lot of recalibration to get these perfectly matched with each other. Okay, so that's, that's the basic task. Now the interesting thing about it for us is you can do repetition suppression paradigms with this. And it gets quite abstract because now we're not doing repetition suppression on the movements. We're not doing it on the objects. Uh, we're not doing it on the position of the objects. We're doing repetition suppression on the, category, right, the, the item properties, right? So, so on two trials in a row, the repetition suppression would be, oh, in both cases I've got one heavy, uh, one heavy cold, one light cold, one heavy, one, two light items, right? Uh, so two of these, or two of these, or two of these, two of these, two of these in a row versus something else. And that's, that's the nature of the repetition suppression. The prediction would be we'd be able to identify brain areas that are sensitive to this sort of high level representation of the object features that make them relevant for action planning. And so this is the main effect of doing the task versus baseline. This is just a reality check, right? So we got parietal premotor, dorsolateral prefrontal, ventral premotor, pericularis, visual areas, uh, SMA, uh, pre-SMA. So uh, yeah, so the idea is we're going to be really looking for RS in this case, uh, sort of as a perceptual problem. I, Perceptual grouping and maybe um, identifying the problem structure that the person needs to, to use. All right, so I won't go through the uh, performance detail in great detail, otherwise, other than just saying they're good at it, they're 93% accurate, they're consistent on novel repeat trials, there's a little bit of a, a repetition of priming effect. Um, so we can model that out easily in the imaging data. Um, so here's the main effect of repetition suppression on this high level uh, repetition of item properties. And the key areas for us are DLPFC, pars of pericularis, uh, posterior parietal, and more anterior cingulate and uh, overlying pre-SMA. These are some of the interesting areas that get recruited as you're, as you're um, identifying these interesting features. Now, if you ask subjects, they're not, they're not aware of this. And none of this is due to verbal labeling or tagging. They, they, you know, Post-test interviews, they have no idea that there's, this is going on. They're just so focused on item individual item identification. They're not really uh, recognizing that there's these kinds of inherent structures. And the, and the pseudo-random property of the RS design uh, keeps them confused. So this is all going on uh, under, somewhere underneath the top of explicit knowledge. So uh, that's 7,200 trials. Could we do the same? Can we, um, can we do any more with this task? Well, one of the things you can do is you can try to uh, drill in a little bit harder um, by narrowing the number of possible solution paths. And it's really easy to do. You just say, Okay, the first item put in this bag, the second item put in this bag, the third item put in this bag, the fourth, so you alternate bags. If you do that, you're down all, instantly down to only 72, 720 trials. So you cut the number of possible plans down tenfold. So it's a much easier planning problem. In terms of 
cognitive load. It's actually much higher because you've got to now do this tra parallel tracking. So if you look at RS on the case where um, you know, you've simplified this, and then we compare the differences of these RSs, which gets kind of gnarly, uh, you see that the key areas that, that persist, um, well, I shouldn't say that. The key areas of difference the key, uh, would be the uh, pars apericularis and, and more uh, dorsal areas of uh, rostral premotor. So we're really kind of intrigued by this pars apericularis site. Um, and so this is where uh, 70, essentially 7,200 plans uh, is greater than 720 plans in this kind of high dimensional space. So, so the point here is you can, you can start to reveal brain systems that are, that are uh, sensitive to these pretty abstract properties in the objects that are going to drive the planning process itself. Um, you know, I don't want to overinterpret this, you know, it's close to language areas and Broca's areas and yada, yada. I don't think we're at a point where we can make strong inferences about that at that kind of level yet. Okay, can we go any farther? Can we kind of look at a transition between uh, sort of the, the grouping properties versus the, okay, here's, I got to do this, then I got to do this, then I got to do this. Um, so there's, if you think about uh, a process model, there's a couple possible results, right? So one would be, essentially, you kind of come up with some kind of mental representation of what you have to do. There's a single representation. We'll see it in RS, and it doesn't. It's the same whether it's at this abstract level or if it's at a concrete physical level, kind of like Yorn's study where you hierarchically organize your actions, right? Or it could be that your sequential processing. I've got a representation at this abstract level, and now there's a new representation once I start translating that into movements. Or finally, there's some kind of cognitive addition problem where I've got the abstract thing and then the abstract plus the concrete kind of representation. So that's, that's the setup for what we're interested in here. So we needed a new gadget to, because the bagger's task isn't a rich enough space to get at this. So uh, that's the world's largest Swiss Army knife. Um, so we kind of looked at a lot of tools thinking about this, and we just made a virtual tool. And so this is it's, it's this five-pointed thing that you can rotate uh, um, with a joystick. So leftward joysticks uh, uh, rotate it counterclockwise, rightward joystick movements, rotate it clockwise. And so your goal is to take these little balls and get them underneath this, wherever this thing is. And if it's a circle, you've got a, um, I can't remember, uh, yeah, you've got to hit a thumb movement to drop in. And if it's a triangle, you've got to use your index finger to move it in the other direction. So you either got to lift it into the circle or drop it into the circle, depending on its spatial features. So it's, it's just a simple gizmo. Every trial has four movements. Every trial has two. Uh, you're, if you do it correctly, you're going to win two coins. Uh, you always try to finish with yourself positioned in the next best possible position. So if you had another movement, you could get an even uh, more coins. Now that's, so you're just making four movements, right, to, to collect two coins. And uh, it all makes sense in a second why we're doing this. Now, the cool thing about it is they actually don't make the movements until we don't care about the movements anymore. So they look at the stimulus. They figure out the four movement action set they want to do. When they're ready, they hit the uh, a ready button. There's a d delay, and then they, they, they go. So we're really just looking at this planning process where they're look, staring at this object and figuring out how they're going to act on it in four movements, and, uh, and then off they go. And then once they go, it disappears, so they have no actual perceptual uh, stimuli after, after they've uh, made, established the plan. So now, now here's, what we're, here's what we can do. You can actually, if you think about it, if you think about joystick movements as one class of actions and button presses as another class of action, then, then on trial to trial, we can manipulate the planning structure. So they're essentially doing an ABBA kind of action or an ABAB kind of action or an AABB kind of action. Simple, right? And uh, now you can see where we're going. You can do repetition suppression on the structure. So it's this really abstract sense of, sort of hierarchical movements you're going to make, you, um, but they're not specific movements, right? 
and or we can couple that with specific movements. In this case, we can do A B B A, but it's really you know left button left button gets repeated two times in a row. So it's motor, and that that will also have this abstract property as well. So it's basically um, R S on both abstract and concrete as versus just repetition suppression on the abstract. Uh, accuracies are good. People can do this, you know, 95th percentile, 95% uh, accuracy. There, uh, there's no difference between novels and repeat in terms of accuracies. There are a little bit of AABB tends to be easier to do than these others, um, both in terms of planning and execution. Uh, we have easy and hard versions of the task. So here's a case where you've got a uh, rotate drop, rotate drop. Uh, here's a case, it's much trickier. You've got to think about, okay, I've got to um, uh, lift, rotate, lift, rotate, because um, you've got both drops and lifts going on at once. So we can, we can vary underneath. We can also manipulate difficulty. You can see difficulty effects in the planning time, which is all good. Uh, there's, a, there's actually some negative repetition priming in terms of behavior. Uh, but it's a very small effect and non significant. Okay, here's the main, uh, just to finish up, here's the main effect of doing the task. It's the same old uh, visual motor circuits, including DLPFC, um, lots of motor areas, Prius, uh, Prius MA, SMA, so forth. Now, if we look at task difficulty, so we're not looking at any repetition suppression here, we're just saying an easy versus easy planning versus difficult planning. This should replicate sort of the Tower of, old Tower of London literature, which is essentially looking at load effects on planning. And you see that. You see uh, primarily DLPFC. So you can sort of think of this as the process model for planning, right? These are the areas that, that sustain the, 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 um, sort of the information for uh, doing planning, but the actual representations are not necessarily in these locations. If you look at the repetition suppression on the structure, and this is not the movements, not RS on the movements, but just RS on this more abstract AABB kind of property of solving a problem, you essentially get uh, just pre-SMA. It's greater on the left side than the right. It also includes underlying anterior cingulate um, in this site here. Now, the critical question was, for us was if you now look at that plus the motor RS, are you going to see this plus RS in motor regions or is this sort of representation going to shift into, into uh, purely motor areas? And this is the result. It's a little hard to see in here. But it's, it's essentially all motor areas. There's, I don't have the medial wall here, but there's nothing on the medial wall. It's, it's, so this, the representation is completely shifted into this, um, this motor domain. So this is the case where the RS is specific to exact movements um, that they're anticipating making. Don't forget that none of this, none of these results are related to actual physical movements. This is their planning these movements, okay? So, um, yeah, this is the uh, planning process. So that's, in a nutshell, um, kind of what, what I wanted to present to you today. Um, I think, you know, we've been able to kind of go through from these very uh, sort of um, narrow views of what planning is, where you see a problem and you get a result and there's a movement at the end. To, there's, there are these intermediate features in there that are quite interesting. You know, we've just barely begun to slice into this. I think there's going to be a lot more fidelity. There's going to be some kind of syntactic structure to this that will be interesting to identify. It looks like it's, it's happening in these sort of staged Event, you know, you'll have a higher level ab ab abstraction, but then as you get closer to movement implementation, these representations really do shift, and you see the planning in these uh, motor-specific areas. Um, and so with that, I'll take questions, and thanks. <clears throat> that was really lovely. Um, <clears throat> so in that last study, you have the participants planning with the configuration there in front of them, and then when they have to execute, the configuration's gone. They have to That's do correct. the sequence of moves by memory. 
So I'm wondering if some of what you're seeing could be due to the complexity of that task, and if you were to leave the configuration up so that they could conceptualize, and then when you say execute, turn that conceptualization into the motor sequence with the configuration there, whether you might get a different pattern of, of how the sequence and the motoric um, suppressions interplay. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I, it's an impaired question. I don't, I don't, I bet it would be the same just because the sort of in a naturalistic sense, as you're doing things, you're usually being supported by memory all the time anyway. You know, these parts and these objects are over here in mind. I need to bring them over here and combine them with these. Rarely do you actually have the entire problem space, set, you know, all the, all the objects in the set in front of you with in an organized fashion so that, that you're essentially externalizing memory. I think you're always bringing it in in these planning tasks. I mean, the IKEA instructions are there to essentially put, do that for you, but you can see they don't work very well. So you um, seemed uh, a little resistant to trying to uh, explain the uh, inferior frontal result, um, maybe in the interest of time. So now that we have more time, <laughs> I want to um, hear your thoughts on it, in part because I'm having uh, trouble even getting the direction of the comparison, um, uh, because it's a repetition suppression effect that was greater in one condition than another, but I'm not sure whether there was just overall more activation in one condition right. or another. Can, can you just first unpack the data for that yeah. frontal effect and then if you would speculate a little bit? Um, because um, as you might know, my group's done a lot of work on that area and biasing uh, competitive interactions. And so, um, but I can't figure out even what direction your effects are. It's, it's, the, it's the easy direction. Uh, in other words, I've got, I've got the, um, 7,200 case, then there's uh, a big R RS on that. Now I've got the 720 case, and there's a s smaller RS on that. But are they starting at the same point? Yeah, they're starting at relative. So there's no difference on, on a, a, no, a non-adapted right. trial, on a Correct. baseline trial, there's no difference Correct. between those two conditions? Yes. Even though there's a big RT difference? Is that surprising, or no? There's no difference. No. <laughs> is, is that just at a whole brain level? I mean, have you poked into that area yeah, at all? Yeah, the whole brain level, there's no difference. Okay, but, but you haven't looked at it like a region of interest level analysis? No, it's no. Just, they're the same. They're the same. Okay. So um, I have a question about, um, in the first experiment, in the baggers task, again, it's a question about the IFG activation and the degree to which, or the, the suppression effect, the degree to which you think it's driven by the action history with the object. It, that is, do they ha need to have gone through that whole baggers task and really think about the choices, the properties in terms of their uh, consequences for action, per se, or are there, is that merely a, a difficulty of semantic, you know, property selection and you know, a sort of the more, you know, branching tree in any kind of, um, you know, the more complex the choice That's structure? Because in the second experiment where you did unpack the, the motor effect, you didn't see IFG repetition suppression right. there for the motor That's effect. Right. So it maybe suggests that in the first experiment that isn't, the IFG activation uh, repetition suppression is not related to action. Yeah, Put, putting those yeah, two experiments exactly. together. Yeah, so in other words, we're, we're essentially back here. It's yeah. Grouping. We just, it's, a, it's a more complex grouping. I think in terms of naturalistic action planning, that's something that always occurs, right? Uh, we we kind of discount that that's just, that's going to completely drive your performance. You think about putting those cars back together, right? The key step, initial step, is all this kind of perception. Feature grouping is that really perception grouping. Into uh, logical bins that can then be used for assembly. And yeah, I think the baggers is, is really sitting at that level. Initially, we thought, oh yeah, this is planning, but it's right. really just right, a, right, right. It's okay. object. Thank you. Yeah. That's why we kind of went on in the second task. More, more grappa. <laughs> so let me, uh, 
um, it was not clear to me um, what was constraining the predictions for the imaging. So for example, when you saw pre-SMA in one condition for, I think it was related to the planning, and then pre-motor cortex, I mean, what were you expecting to see? What, what kind of circuitry are you thinking about that would um, lead you to expect, for example, pre-SMA versus pre-motor cortex? Um, right. So if you could flesh that out a little. Um, yeah, I, there, so there's three ways I could have done this, right? I could have made it look like I had a really strong prediction. <laughs> And I did, and I was wrong. <laughs> so I really thought this was going to be IFG, uh, PMV, standard sort of action, a prax praxis circuit. That's where we're going to see planning. Um, clearly, that's not the case, right? Yeah. But Outside of that, it's like, you know, it's, 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 it's wide open. And so I can, I can go back now and give you some just those stories if you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, the interesting one to me is this pre-SMA, because we see this a lot in the sequencing literature when you move to hierarchical sequences or abstract sequences or you're having to switch between sequential item sets. So it's, it seems to be operating at some kind of superordinate level. So that, that I can give a just so story for that I think is pretty compelling. The, the tricky one I think is, the, is sort of the top of the pars pericularis result, which um, is driven but more by the, <clears throat> the feature grouping, and that's just a domain I don't work in enough to, to be ready to comment on. So your results are all based on repetition suppression, but the question in my mind is, where is this how is this abstract information represented? And I would think that because you have clear, different abstract structures, in the planning stage, you could do an analysis, a multivariate analysis, whether you can distinguish those abstract structures or detect a similarity structure among abstract structures that would be reflected in the neural similarity structure. And since you've got the data, I just wonder, have you tried to use that kind of approach? Not yet. I mean, that's the next step, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Scott, I'm having some difficulty understanding the difference between uh, the representations in level two and three. Um, so the sequence pattern RS versus the motor RS, uh, because you then have further motor uh, processing in step four, if I understand it. So what is the, in this particular paradigm using, uh, is there a difference between the kind of representation at level two and three? Isn't, isn't, isn't the information the same? It says uh, take object A and move it to position B. No. So, so the idea is um, there's a pattern in the solution. Right? It's an AABB pattern or an ABBA pattern, completely independent of the object and completely independent of the physical movement you're going to make. And at that, that abstract pattern level, this is where you can see the pre-SMA involvement. And now when you actually engage in, a, in, okay, here's the specific physical movements I'm going to do. And if those are repeating, right, so you're now looking at the RS for what is essentially body-specific movements, then it shifts into all these pre-motor planning areas. Sorry, so, so then the, the, uh, the, make sure I get it, uh, then when you look at the RS in so level here. two, uh, you're doing this across different types, say, of objects and different types of whatever, yeah. whereas in case three, it's the same set of objects. No, it's still the same, different objects, right? You can well, then that's why, that's why I get confused and I don't see why they're different. So that's, what, that's, why this is, that's why we made the gadget is because 
you could have um, you could have completely different gadgets from trial to trial that require identical movements to get the to get the to win the game, right? So the RS uh, is is going to be sensitive to the physical planning, and in that case, it also has to be sensitive to this hierarchy, this uh, sort of abstract uh, patterning as well. So that's, that's the beauty of this, is every trial of the object is different. So you're never, you're never getting um, any kind of RS associated sensitivity to the, to the objects itself. So in that case, you can break out, you know, you, you were not at this level down here. You know. Any other questions? Okay, um, it's almost 10. Would it be all right, if we, so is, we usually have, I think, a half hour break. How about a 20 minute break? Have some coffee and uh, come back for Mary Lou's talk. And let's thank Scott for a very entertaining talk. <laughs>